With all of the gloom and doom in the news today, I thought this week we'd take a different direction. Before I get into that, though, the president has issued guidelines suggesting a three-phase return to work. Martial arts school owners should be able to open in phase two. And you can't really expect your school to fill up as fast as it emptied, but there is an opportunity for you to hit the ground running. When parents have to return to work, their children will need safe, secure supervision during the workday. This is why schools should consider launching their summer camp earlier than later. Be sure to listen to last month's podcast with Jim King on how to run a summer camp. Even with social distance restrictions and student staff ratios, you should be able to generate some revenue pretty quickly by enrolling students as soon as you have a hard date for your school to reopen do not make the mistake of waiting to start promoting your program until you open. Start to market it now to your new students. You can truthfully say that there are limited spots available. Modern members have access to a massive summer camp and after school resource library in the members area. So be proactive, start planning now. If this is your first time hosting a summer camp, be careful not to over promise with field trips and special events. Keep the focus on martial arts so that the Department of Children and Families, DCF, don't come after you for being unlicensed daycare. That's a common mistake schools make. Teach two martial arts classes each day and keep the focus around martial arts. Be sure to visit the Martial Arts Teachers Association at martialartsteachers.com. Now on to today's show. Wow. Mike Anderson is one of the most unheralded pioneers of sport karate and kickboxing around the world. In 1973, he changed the sport of point karate forever by being the first promoter to require competitors to wear safety gear that launched point karate. In 1974, he created the Professional Karate Association, or PKA. He hosted the first PKA World Championships in Los Angeles. That event was broadcast as an ABC special, and it was one of the highest rated TV shows that year for ABC. The event audience was full of stars from movies and TV. They all saw Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace, Jeff Smith, and Isaiah Duenas become the first PKA World Champions. That show catapulted them into the sport's first superstars. After the show's huge success, Mike sold his shares in the PKA to his partners, Don and Judy Quine, for $1. He then traveled to Berlin, Germany, to partner with his friend and student, George Brickner, to create the World Association of Kickboxing Organizations, or the WACO. Over the course of the next few weeks, you're going to learn the stuff behind the stuff. Not only will you learn what famous black belts were hired by Mike to run secret CIA operations in Iran, you'll find out why he sold the PKA for a dollar after its highly successful debut. Mike has a 155 IQ. He speaks seven languages plus dialects, and he has lived a life straight out of a James Bond book. He has been one of my best friends since the mid-70s, as I described in my book, Who Killed Walt Bone, which I'm sure you've read. (laughs) But after listening to this interview with Mike and some of the stories he shares, I have no doubt you will run out and grab that book. After part one of my Mike Anderson series, you'll get your Teach Like a Pro teaching tip of the week straight from the MATA certification program at matacertification.com. Quick warning, the audio on this interview with Mike could be better but it's a question of style versus substance. The substance is so strong that a little bit of warbling in the audio is not really an issue. Enjoy. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. (laughs) Yeah, believe it or not, uh, my father was a Texan from from Dallas, but he was a criminal. And uh, by the time I was born, he was given the electric chair for, for... killing nine police officers. So well, my mother moved back. My mother was a little Brooklyn girl, little little Jewish Brooklyn girl. And he was just the opposite of I me. Mean, he was a Texas redneck, crazy. How did they get together? Killer. <laughs> uh, 
He was doing a job in New York. He was only 21. He was doing a job in New York. Uh, Lois Green was my uncle. Mm -hmm. And he was public, um, uh, public enemy number one, I think. And you know, he'd do all the dirty work. I mean, you know, the two brothers, the two Anderson brothers, who were a year apart. Your my, father and your uncle. My father and my uncle, who was a year older. Um, James was my father. Robert was his, his name, Robert. And they were two big Texas guys, very muscular, not very educated, but very uh, uh, talented in, in, in doing things. But they didn't get that far in school because they were busy bootlegging, seriously. And my father was bootlegging already with a car from uh, Texas to Oklahoma. Oklahoma was dry for 75 years. He was bootlegging at six years old. And they caught him at eight. <laughs> it's his first record. <laughs> hey. How does a six-year-old bootleg? He puts it in the car and heads off through the wood, just like anybody else. How does he reach the gas pedal? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he was a big six-year-old. It's, yeah. a, good, it's a good question, <laughs> but he did it. They, they were big guys. How about that? Yeah, they were big. He was finally incarcerated for whatever, I can, he did so many things. When he was 16 years old and was sent to uh, Angora, mm -hmm. Louisiana uh, Penitentiary. And he got out and uh, that's when uh, he and his brother started killing policemen. What happened was when the police came to, uh, knew that they did this and that, and the police came to investigate them, and this is in Texas, mm -hmm. And uh, the, the policeman disappeared. Period. Forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nine, nine of them. Nine of them. Nine of the cops disappeared. And one day, they were in New York City, uh, drunk. You know, he's, they're Indians, okay? They're Indian. What are they doing in New York City? They're in Indian Texas. Irish. Well, uh, back it up, Lois Green, I guess. His, you know, his, his hitman. Oh. Oh, yeah. Because these guys are real serious. And wait, you can see my father. I wish I had a, a muscular picture of him, but he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Wow. He really did. Yeah, he Just was. Just kind of natural. Yeah, he was naturally huge oh. and uh, in the right place. And he swore he never lifted weights in prison. I don't, I don't know whether to believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But they were in New York City and they robbed the first store uh, on Fifth Avenue at noon. What kind of store was it? Fur. For the first store of New York City, okay, went to some old first store, and they're running down the street drunk, okay, with furs. <laughs> Middle of the day, yeah. Fifth Avenue at noon, okay, and uh, <laughs> and the police got after them, and they went down a side street, and the police said, "Stop or I'll shoot." Shot one in the air, and that was it. Five thousand witnesses. Uh, my dad and his. Uh, Brother shot him dead right there. Really? Yeah, shot him dead. Broad daylight in front of 5,000 people in New York City. And they took off. They uh, made it all the way to, uh, this, this is 1941. They made it all the way to Texas, I mean to Arkansas. Yeah. In the roadblock. I mean, it was more than a roadblock. It was the, the state of Arkansas police and the FBI and everybody else. Because these guys were obviously dangerous. And um, they crashed the car and went to jump this fence and they jumped the fence and hit on the other side. And, and the last thing my brother, uh, my dad's brother said to him was, don't let them get you. And he died right there. Yeah. And James Anderson with three bullets in him, they got him three times. They got him three times. They shot him three times. And Robert obviously was shot as well. Oh, they killed him. Shot him dead. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Shot him dead. There were 200 cops out there. It wasn't like there was just uh, two, two or yeah. three cops. This yeah. was Bonnie and Clyde stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Really. yeah. And he knew, uh, he knew, he knew, he knew that, uh, he was from the same neighborhood as, 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 uh, as Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker. Wow. Yeah. They were from the same neighborhood, West Ellis. He ran off through the woods, through the Ozarks with dogs and police and, not helicopters, because they don't, I don't yeah. think they had helicopters then. And did he tell you this story? Yeah, he did, he did. Yeah. Be, because it, what brought it up was, uh, I, I read a book called 
It's called The Trail of the Texans, mm -hmm. a book about him. And a book about your father. Oh, yeah. The Trail of the Texans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there was a, uh, a big um, newspaper. Anyway, I mentioned about the, you know, the brothers caught, accused of killing uh, 11 policemen, but they, they got the two and... You don't have that clipping by chance. God, I wish I did. My uncle had a I had no idea how to get it to hold that man. The subject came up when, when I was 13 years old, he got out of prison. Oh, they blamed the killings, all the killings, on his brother. On Robert. On Robert. Wow. Yeah, and that's what it said there, brother rat, and that it, it, it pissed my father off. But his brother was dead, so what were they going to sure. do? Yeah. And so he uh, ended up doing 10 to 20 instead of the electric chair, and he did 13. When I was 13 years old, he got out of prison, and, and he let me ride with him on his fruit truck. He delivered fruit. In Dallas. job. In Dallas, yeah. It was his first job out of prison. And I, I asked him, because I had seen all this stuff about killing the cops mm -hmm. you know, on the paper. I said, I remember this exactly, exactly. I says, well, what happened to those policemen? Did, did you did y'all really kill them, the ones that disappeared? You know, he says, well, I ain't saying I did, and I ain't saying I didn't. But the best place to bury a corpse is under a fresh dug grave. <laughs> Those nine cops that disappeared, that's where they went. Wow. Kind of clever for... I remember you telling me that story. Kind of clever for two, you know, 16-year-old kids or however old they were when they I were mean, doing that. I mean, stalking through a cemetery in the middle of the night looking for a fresh... And then they dump the body, throw some, some dirt on it. Yeah. And then the next day, the actual funeral happens. <laughs> no, the, no, the funeral had already happened, see. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, and there was already a fresh dirt. So they just found a couple of them, and one of these days they're going to dig them up, and they're going to be too, too, too bad, is there? He did not know right from wrong. He didn't. He just did not know right from wrong, that guy. And he was very nice to me. He was uh, very nice to my mother. Uh, and to my little brothers, who were not his sons, who were my stepfather's son, who was a was a psychopath. I pushed my stepfather around like crazy when my well, father was out of prison. Before we get to that, let's yeah. talk more about your dad coming out of All prison. Right. He's working as a fruit um, laborer. Yeah. yeah. And your relationship with him is good. It's growing. Oh, yeah, it's, it was great. It was completely wide open. And then what, what happened to him and, and you guys from that point on? Well, I tormented my stepfather when my real father was out of prison. And he grabbed my stepfather, who was 200 pounds, he was a big guy too, and picked him up with one hand and said, you know, if you touch that boy again, or my mother, I'm going to just cut your head off. And he meant it to enjoy her as a woman beater, you know, as a coward anyway. You know. One day, my stepfather comes in, and I'm scrambling eggs and bacon, and he said something to me, I said, oh, oh f you, more or less, because mm -hmm. I, I was very disrespectful to him, I always was, and uh, hell, I tried to kill him from the from the time I was seven years old, and he goes, blah, and hits me, and the grease goes everywhere, and I knew right there my father was back in jail. <laughs> oh, because he'd have never done that if your dad was out. Oh, heck no, he wouldn't. And dad would have killed him. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in and, and, and those days, the style was to wear taps on your shoes. Mm -hmm. And the taps would wear off, and there were like razor blades hanging back there. Well, I was lucky, because he started beating me. And right away, I raised my legs. I cut him with the, I cut his wrist with the taps. He had to go to the hospital, so he wow. couldn't kill me, because he probably would have. Because he was, you know, so irate because I screwed over him all the time. This is it. In, in the interim. Um, I stabbed him when I was when I was eight years old, okay? Mm. I stabbed my stepfather with an ice pick in the back. Mm. And when I was 10 years old, I shot him point blank in the face with a 38. How did he survive that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good question, huh? <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's my, and then I, then I stabbed him with a, a butcher knife when I was uh, 12. And then 
uh, when I was 14, I shot him 10 times with the 22. Nine times in the head and once in the back. Because you see, I couldn't kill a guy, you know, I tried. <laughs> I, you know, I walked up to him and said, hey. I walked up to him and said, hey, Dad, how you doing? Bow! With a 38 pistol. And it went right through here and went around here. Couldn't kill the son. <laughs> <laughs> I could shoot the hair off a fly's legs at 100 yards. Okay? I was an excellent shot. Better than an excellent shot. I was a circus sh shooter. And I got the medals to prove it. This is the main story of this podcast, and it's a doozy. I apologize in advance because the audio does get a little wonky, but it's well worth the wait. Hang in there. Haven't you just have been in prison or something in jail? And no. Let out and came after you. So, yeah, yeah. It, was it, he was at Rust Institute for the Criminally Insane. For what? Crazy criminal. <laughs> uh, he was a he was a psychopath, a real psychopath, and uh, he liked to beat children and women. Oh, my dog Blackie was barking. I was I, I was watching TV, and I was watching him. Blackie starts barking and barking at the door, and then I heard the door handle hell turn. I said, oh, "It's Jimmy Burgess down the street playing whatever his little tricks." I opened the door and I scored him, or, you know, or yeah. something like that. And I went and I pulled the shade back, and there he was. And let me tell you what, they say your, your legs shake when you're afraid. Mm -hmm. My leg went, well, I can't do it now, but my leg went, shook that high, it did. So that's how terrified I was. I went from being terrified to being not afraid of anything on the planet within minutes. Because when I hit him, when he started running that, 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 out the door, after I hit him, I never experienced fear in my life again. I am literally fearless. Fearless. I'm not afraid of anything. Weird, huh? So he's at the door. Your leg goes high. What happens next? Oh, let me in. I said, Mother, it's Roy Parrish. And she was on the phone. She came running in there. She says, don't make jokes about that, Mike. Although she knew I wouldn't. And he saw her and boom, he kicked the door. Uh, and I ran to get my gun. And he kicked it again, kicked it in. Okay. It was a, a glass pane door. And he went after her. And I went and got my gun. And I came and shot him. So I went from being so terrified you can't imagine. Can you imagine when your leg shakes up in the air? Involuntarily, I've never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. I went from being... You're how old? I was 14. Small 14. I looked like a 10-year-old. Yeah, I was small, immature. Where were your brothers? I, let, I, I put them out the window, three brothers, all three of them. When I went in there, when I went in, in the room to get my gun, the first thing I did was open the big window and told them to run to the Smith house. And then I came back and, and, and shot him. So I had enough sense to get them out of there. You were 14, first. and how old were they? Seven. The tw twins were seven, and Bill was uh, three years old. They were pretty traumatic. I got my brothers out the window, okay, and told them to run to the neighbors. And I came back, and I had two 22 longs in my 22 next to my bed. I put one in the chamber, one in my mouth, and I went in back around there to shooting, and I aimed, and he had a, on a hat and a, and a coat. It was Christmas. It was Christmas time. I was worried because, you know, I had to make this one count, you know. And I shot him right in the ear. Left him, left him, left him. Ran back around, put the bullet in my mouth. And my mother had to come around through the living room. Almost shot my mother. Mm. And I, took the, I took the slack out of the trigger. And, and she just said, man, get him. And my mom was behind me. And uh, She was encouraging him. Oh, yeah. He was going to kill us for sure. Okay, you're like, no question about it. <laughs> so, and my dog had him. Blackie had him on my foot, and uh, heard some stumbling around in there when my uh, when my mom came in, and then here he came, running out the door, holding his ear. First time in my life, I had him on the run. Uh, uh, but anyway, he went out the door, so I ran out the door after him, and it was a it was eleven o'clock at night. And it was a fifty model Ford, and just as he went to open the door, I shot. It was seventy five. It's from here to the fence at night. <laughs> Let's talk about some shooting. Uh, and and uh, I shot him dead in the back. Mm. I didn't have time to do anything else. Yeah. So I shot him in the back, went back to my house, opened my drawer, which was full of bullets. I mean, literally full of bullets. Filled my mouth up, came back up there, and he was still sitting there. And I think the third shot killed him. So I'm shooting through the window when I was up. And the third shot, yeah, he, he went like this, and, and the music was going. And this guy tried him, you know. And this guy didn't know what was going on. He was so drunk or in, or whatever, and I didn't know who it was. He's in the passenger seat of the truck. 
His buddy yeah. is behind the wheel, yeah. has been waiting for him. Right. They say, he out. was holding his left side here, weapon mm -hmm. the first bullet. And the next one went in his back, but he was still holding here. And the next eight shots. Eight shots. Went, went right through here. And this is, it is, I can't find it anywhere. It's somewhere. But the Dallas Morning News front page. And so the cock sitting there with a, with a quarter, holding the quarter uh -huh. in front of a car window. And the next picture over showed the car window with seven holes in it. <laughs> and you couldn't say it by the quarter. So I shot 75 feet in nine. So I got him uh, eight times dead in the back of the head. Shot group that big at, at night, 75 feet. And I came back in the house, and the bullets killed my mouth up again, and the car took off. And I just, I, all I had on was my jeans. I didn't have any shirt or shoes or anything. And I'm just out in the middle of the street, and right now I was saying, you know, finally getting this son of a bitch, you know, yeah. finally. Because I tried to kill him so many times. And I shot, bam, and, and I gave him a little elevation. This was luck. A little elevation, make sure. And sure enough, I found 10 bullets. And I one hole here, one in the back, one in the back of the head, and seven in his right temple. Seven points, such a way the cops didn't come out here. Justifiable homicide. He came to kill us. Yeah, he came, came to kill us. And uh, they didn't even take my gun. Story. The guy who was driving him. I told him how close he came to dying. He came with literally within a hair of dying. I took the slack out of the trigger. I was going to shoot him right between the eyes. And I didn't know who it was. I couldn't tell. And for some reason, I had the reasoning that, hey, he might have to be a father, have kids, not be a part of this. Mm -hmm. Besides, I don't want to waste a bullet on Roy. <laughs> and that's what closed the deal. And I told him that the next morning. I said, that's what closed the only thing the reason you're alive is because I didn't want to waste a shot. And that's true. Here's our Teach Like a Pro tip of the week. These lessons are straight from the MATA certification course at matacertification.com. This week, Module 1, Lesson 5, False Praise. Nothing steadily erodes your credibility with a student like false praise. If everything that a student does is good job or awesome, how will students know if they're improving or not? Why would they be motivated to improve if they're getting the highest possible praise already? What's higher than awesome? When you praise, be specific. When your praise is believable, the follow-up suggestion is as well. For instance, nice job. Let's see if you can put two of those together. Or, I like how your sidekick is coming along. Be sure to recoil it as fast as you locked it out. Or, that kick has potential. Just roll your hip a little more to make it more powerful. Avoid blanket false praise. It will only make your job more difficult. If we are promising that we teach self-defense, verbal self-defense is part of it. So false praise certainly does not weigh into those lessons. Students, especially children, need to face adversity and have someone be honest with them. The participation trophy days have created a generation of students that have never been corrected or criticized. Thanks for listening. Good job. You're awesome. Was that an amazing story or was that an amazing story? More to come next week with Mike Anderson. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe, share, and review. Thank you.